I'm going to be fair. They've made those criticisms for many, many years to say, well, you don't understand the issues. Or you just believe this way because somebody told you to believe this way. And there's a lot of adults that will do that too. So don't let them fool you when they have those, when they accuse you of those things. I think it is very um, short sighted. Um, sometimes I find young people are more educated on issues. Yeah. It's interesting because you can, you know, it's all in how you educate your, what you educate yourself with, but especially our media has become so polarized. But however, I think a significant thing is for you to know what you stand for and why, not just because you have been taught by me, by anyone else that this is life. I think it's, that's something you need to find out for yourself. And as you kind of form your, your way of thinking. Yes. I can just hear you walk through the tightrope right now. I'm very sorry. No, I don't feel like I am actually, because I feel very strongly about that. Um, I like, there are some things that I agree with my parents on very much. There are some other things that we disagree and we can actually have disagreeing conversations and be civil, you know, and actually not even just civil, but we can, we can say, here's how I feel. Here's how you feel. And what I love sometimes, and I've, I've realized that I am fortunate that, you know, to most of the family members that I will discuss politics with, which is not everybody that they understand that you can have different viewpoints and still like people. I mean, some of you like mint chocolate chip. And it, it causes us to bring some things into question about you. So, you know, but I, uh, I actually used that analogy in my college class the other night. I had a guy who was like, he's like, who hurts you? I want to know who hurts you. And I'm like, well, apparently somebody who like mint chocolate chip thinks it sucks. But anyway. All right. So let's get started. So when you think about the early Cold War, a.k.a. World War II through the 50s, there are two presidents you need to know. Truman, because, I mean, quite frankly, he drops the bomb so he gets to stay. And he is going to be followed up with the general, which is Ike. That's right. And so we'll talk about Ike a little bit later. But we're going to start with Truman. I, You know, when I think about Harry Truman, overall, Harry was honest. I probably said this to you on Friday. I may not have or when we talked about dropping the atomic bombs on Friday, but that he was the last president without a college degree. That's that's kind of neat to me. And he's going to actually face some of the biggest decisions, you know, in our kind of this formative period of the 1900s. So let's talk about how do we structure things after World War II? Because World War I, we didn't do such a good job, right? Absolutely not. So we got to figure out how to make this work. Um, we got to figure out how to make this work. And so, yay, one of my dear friends is going to be coming to Dauphin Island in a couple weeks from Indiana. That's cool. I love surprises. All right. So here's the deal. I'm about to explain Germany to you in the simplest way I know how and what is going to happen with Germany. And then we will come back to it as we talk about Berlining. All right. So first of all, last time we left Germany to her own devices after basically stripping all the materials away from her. We said, color this map, Germany. But wait, we're taking your crayons. Wait, we're taking your colored pencils. You can't have any markers. You know, why didn't you color it? And that's pretty much what we did, right? Radicalize this. Oh, and you can't have any paper either. So, yeah. So this is Germany. Now. What's going to happen to Germany at the end of World War II is four nations are going to get pieces of Germany because we get this whole idea at the end of World War II. Let's split everything in half, right? Probably. Just seems like this amazing idea. Let's split it into pieces because when we break things apart, that always works. What? It's like an assembly line for Germany. So the first piece... And the slightly biggest piece goes to the USSR. And we're going to talk about why they get the bigger piece. The skimpy piece goes to, I know it looks like with my map here that the U.S. is going to get the biggest chunk, but we'll fix that there a little bit. Maybe. 
All right. So the skimpiest piece goes to France. The USSR gets the biggest piece. Kind of like, why does France get a piece anyway? Yeah, I mean, come on. But they won in Luxembourg, so that's why. So we split it into four pieces. We basically play Tic Tac Germany. Split it up. Why does the Soviet Union get the biggest piece? Well, because the Soviet Union has Berlin. And it was such a good idea to split Germany that we're like, while we're at it, let's split Berlin into four pieces too. Because that's going to work beautifully, right? Let's just split that city up. Sounds like a wall waiting to happen. I mean, come on, you know. And we will come back to there. So, starting out with Truman, we will define, the other question we have is what do you do with Japan? Let's be honest, we bombed the crap out of Japan. Twice. Yes, and not only just the atomic bombs, but also just land bombing to kind of prep it. Yes, but the water bombing rates cost more deaths. Yes, they did. And they caused more long-term damage because it wasn't as centralized. So we didn't want Japan to turn into another uh, situation like Germany post-World War I. And so the U.S. put some, we had Japan. Russia didn't have Japan. And we kind of made our little territory marks there like, oh, we'll rebuild Japan. So we sent General Douglas MacArthur, Dougie. Something. And so we send him, and Japan goes from one of the least technologically advanced nations to today one of the most. Some things you may not know about Japan. Japan cannot have a standing army or navy, but we don't just leave them out there. We're going to be your army and navy. It's kind of really interesting. We do let them set up their own government, but we will protect them, and they have an alliance with us. It's kind of a different viewpoint. And so I've had... Done a little studying on this because I have students who will ask most times, is Japan still bitter at us? Actually, no, because it's become one of the wealthier nations in the world, one of the most technologically advanced. And it's actually strongly benefited them. Sad to say, wealthy nations are usually content with the way things are. They're poor. They don't have quite um, their poverty compared to much of the rest of the world is nothing. And so overall, like, they're like, hey, that's cool. Just give us anime. So, yes. Okay. My child loves anime already. So, it's, yeah, I see where it's going. Yes. It's an economic miracle, really. I mean, really. It is. It's like an economic Christmas miracle. Bring us, you know, help us rebuild our cities. And it works. Japan is considered one of the best places to live. It's There's a lot of very positive things about Japan. Now. There are war crime trials in both, for both Germans and Japanese people, as we talked about. Uh, this shows you tons of different articles here talking about um, the Allies opened the trials of, of 20 top Germans for crimes of war. And this shows you the pictures of them. This is the guy who first talked about the final solution. This is Hermann Gehring. Um, but anyway. And then this is a picture from the war crime trials of Japan. Now, these were about cruelties beyond basic human rights. You know, I arrest you, I put you in a prison camp, we're fighting. That's normal Geneva Convention kind of stuff, right? Like, that's okay. But when you get into torture, when you get into lack of resources, denial of basic rights, then you get into war crime trials. All right. Yeah, time. Time, time, time. It's good stuff there. All right, so we talked about the United Nations. Here's the member of the Security Council. All right, so what is a Cold War? A Cold War is a war where you know there's tension, but you don't talk about it. Yes. Those were results. Yes. Those are places where it does it does heat up a little bit. But the Cold War is basically going to range in U.S. history, depending on where you want to start it. I like to make it easy. I think the Cold War is basically there when we end World War II. There's tension between the U.S. and Russia. Shots aren't being fired, but perhaps there's one of those situations where you know there are just some people that you don't know why, but you just don't mesh with. You just don't mesh with. And, you know, I, I pride myself, not pride myself, but... I generally find that I can get along with and work with most anybody. 
But there have been a few people in my lifetime who, for whatever reason, like, we just don't jive. And, like, I'm still going to be, I'm going to be cool with somebody I don't jive with, but I'd rather not kind of thing, you know? Do what, man? Oh, the band person. No, the band was like Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But there are sometimes people like that just, that it's, that there's only one way to do life. And, you know, and like I said, I'll, I'll make it work with anybody, but there are personalities I would rather deal with than others, you know. And that just is what it is. Perhaps you have known people that you are truly frenemies with, that you are truly frenemies with, that you play nice. But everybody knows. Everybody knows. And, and I, I can think of, and I, I really don't have a lot of those because I just choose not to be that. I choose not to be like that. And I'm not saying that judgy. I just, I can like shut off like my emotions on things and be like, you know what? I think he is always nice to me. But if Ian's just going to be a jerk, he's just going to be a jerk. And that's how he is, you know. But if it's, but some people can't do that. It's just not in their personality. Uh, you see this a lot of times sometimes with, family members or I think about like divorced parents or you know where you can see where they're playing nice but they really don't want to play nice where like it's an event that everybody has to come and eat together and you're all like hi how are you this is so fun wonderful right and so those are cold wars right where the tension is there perhaps you've walked into something and you're like okay well something's going on here I don't know what it is but there's some real tension in this room right and you've been in those moments so this is how it is between Russia and the U.S. We are in the middle of Cold War at this time. And different people, as I said, count different starting points, but I consider 45. World War II ends, the Cold War begins. Because immediately we are jockeying for who is number one, because there are two number ones. Could you say the moment that the Cold War had been quite long? But there was tension even before. It's so hard to say because I feel like the Cold War was going on before. It, in some ways, it was going on before World War II started, you know. But then you could say, well, 1947, when Berlin, when the Berlin blockade is put up, you could count that as the start. But like I said, for our purposes, with thinking about charting it out on your era chart, it's easy to me if you're like, before 45, World War II, after 45, Cold War, you know. And just to kind of split it, because for a little while, we played nice. We're like, all right, we're on the same team. Yay. Yeah. All right. So how this was perhaps best defined by old Churchill. Good old Winston has a way of just putting things into perspective. He said, it is like an iron curtain has descended across Europe. And he basically said the capitalist nations are on one side, the communists are on the other. And he's right. Now, the iron curtain is not a tangible thing. The iron curtain is not the Berlin blockade, nor is it the Berlin Wall. The iron curtain is an imaginary line. There is a divide in this room. Where is it? So I didn't have to point that. You you know that if I if I say something about this side, then I'm not talking to Abdiel. You know where the line's from, right? Because there is a tangible line that just makes it very easy. Now, it is not a, I'm sorry, there's not a tangible line, but it is, we can tell this side, that side. So it's kind of neat how it works out because you see where the red line is drawn here. This is not a wall. This is not a blockade. It's just literally the nations on one side are communist and the nations on the other side are not. No, it's just it's a different economic system that goes against kind of capitalism. They're the, they're the opposite ends of the spectrum. And so it is kind of. We don't like what's different from us. Everybody's like that, just to make it real simple. All right, so check this out. Having done that, I love this cartoon because it has the Iron Curtain, and on it you see the communist symbol. On this side you see the U.S., France, and Britain, and then it says, you try it, sister, and you see the United Nations, and she's trying to pull up the curtain, but it doesn't work. But it doesn't work. Maybe you maybe you rode in the car when you were little with a brother or sister, and you guys draw, drew a line across the back seat like an unofficial line, like this is my space. Yeah, yeah. And you knew where that line was. Yeah. 
in the middle of the sea was forbidden. There's like no man's land. No man's land. That's right. It is the DMC. <laughs> so Truman's policy is a policy of containment. It's a very the policy of containment. It's also like a dog. It is referred to as the Truman Doctrine. Now, this doesn't mean he sat down one day and wrote this all down and said, this is my doctrine. It means this is the way his policy goes. Let's see how good this cup is. I haven't tried this one out in a while. No, it's going to leak a little bit. That's not a very good cup. I'm telling you. like, I guess I need to bring my other one because my other one will hold. But anyway, my other one's pretty good. Uh, my one that I have at home, and I've taken it before and like held it over people. But I was going to try this one out before I did that. So. Good thing, apparently. But anyway, so... Why wouldn't I open my refrigerator? Because, by the way, when I drink orange juice, which isn't a lot, but I want my orange juice so cold that it is about to burst into orange ice. Like room temperature orange juice, unless it is just freshly squeezed from the orange, should not happen. And so I, I like my orange juice really, really cold. So how smart would it be if I open the fridge? Pour it in the fridge and close the door. But I mean, my orange juice is cold. A straw. <laughs> what has happened is that orange juice has, has spread everywhere, right? And the thing about orange juice, if you've ever spilled orange juice, orange juice is so full of sugar that it's very sticky and icky. And so anything that has been in that fridge that spills, because it gets cold, too, it makes it worse. I don't know if that changes the chemical side of it or if it's just because it dehydrates. But it is disgusting, isn't it? Yeah. And it may, it's almost like the texture is very different from what it was originally when I poured it in the fridge. Now, obviously, we would not do that on purpose. That would be dumb. Instead, we put it in a container. And so Truman says, let's contain communism where it is. No spreading. Yeah. Keep it contained. Now, that's why I have the dog in the fence. A lot of times if you have a, a, a pet, uh, unless you're like me, my little Jack Russell can like jump. She can literally kiss me on the cheek if she chooses to. She is a very good jumper. However, unless you're like that, uh, a lot of times you can put up a little pet gate. And it'll keep your animal on one side, right? And that does what? Contains it. Because on the other side, you can just see all the joy and excitement that that little blonde retriever has on its mind of things it's going to tear up. It's like, he, he, he. Now, I like, Fabian, you were asking a question that I think the cartoon at the top is relevant to. I really like this cartoon. One side shows our view of Russia. The other side shows Russia's, Russia's view of us. Because when we think about a Cold War, we think about Russia coming after us. However, this is a mutual thing. It is a mutual distrust. And they see us as coming after them. Now, and I love how in both of them, like, Uncle Sam is so little on our side and the bear is so... Tenuous. And on the other side, Uncle Sam is like this just like creepy old skeletal looking man. And then you see the little itty bitty teddy bear, you know, and he's not anybody anymore, you know. And so you see these different. So this is George Keenan. George Keenan is the head of foreign policy under Truman. And he is a promoter of this Cold War in far as containment. Now, the difference is we have two different political systems. Two different economic systems. The USSR sees themselves as blocking capitalist aggression. We see ourselves as blocking communist aggression. Fear and suspicion arises when nations distrust each other. A large part of this comes in with the Atomic Energy Commission because now that nuclear weapons are in the are in play. And I think you kind of alluded to that, Hunter. When we bring in the nuclear bombs, everything changes. Because it's it's game on. Like, this is not just like, oh, you dropped a little bomb. It killed like five people. No. 
This is a whole nother world changing I event. Started, like, accessing the wrath of the heavens. I think that's when we started getting scared of ourselves. No doubt. And so we start to argue about what should happen next. And you have some different theories, like the U.S. says, oh, we need to know how many bombs everybody has and how to control them. The Russians are like, no, we don't. And so we have some different opinions on this. Both feel like that atomic warfare should be illegal. Russia's like, you need to destroy your bombs. And we're like, our bombs. Our bombs aren't a problem because we only use them on bad people. And so you start to see these conflicts to develop. Now, Let's talk about the Truman Doctrine, this containment of communism. Truman offers financial assistance to nations in Europe who want to contain communism. This is going to be used by two particular nations, Greece and Turkey. You know, like Thanksgiving, greasy Turkey. I do, too. I love Greek food. All right. The U.S. promises to provide financial aid when Russia tries to take uh, parts of Greece and they force Turkey to give up the Dardanelles. And, in fact, we are going to promise $400 million. Okay. That's a lot of dollars. Oh, it's cute that y'all think that's a lot. <laughs> that's going to be very small, just a little bit. So, this is our promise. Truman Doctrine, think Thanksgiving, greasy turkey. It's about doing what? Containment of <laughs> communism. And we give $400 million. I would contain communism for $400 million. I have no problem with that. Write me the check. I will contain it. Myself, personally. Okay. So, this just kind of goes through the details we just talked about. Uh, let's talk about the Marshall Plan. Now, here's what I want to warn you. The Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine happen closely together. And therefore, if you want to date on the Truman Doctrine, um, I believe it's 46. Let me look that up real quickly. Yes, yes, you can. Let's see. The Truman Doctrine is in, it is 47. And the Marshall Plan is 47. So these two events, uh, well, 47 to 48, these two events happen around the same time, and they're going to sound very similar. The Truman Doctrine, you should remember, containment, greasy turkey. The Marshall Plan is about post-World War II. Here's where we are. The nations of Europe are devastated from World War II. Remember all the times we talked about them bombing the bejesus out of Britain? We, France, France was destroyed. Britain was destroyed. Russia was destroyed. All of these nations in Europe are just destroyed from all of the fighting. And so here's the thing. We've got stuff to sell them, but they don't have the stuff to buy it. And so the U.S., George Marshall, who was the commander of the U.S. Army during World War II, Two makes a plea to Congress to allocate money to help rebuild Europe. He says it is in our long best interest to do this. We offer this, I'm going to tell you this thing. We offer this to all the nations of Europe who were in World War II, including Russia. Russia's like, no. I kind of feel like it's like, oh, Russia, you need some lunch money, huh? We can pay your bill. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it. I, I picture it as passive aggressive, you know, but we do offer money. Uh, Marshall says this isn't about a political ideology. This is about that we need to establish a secure world. Now, how much, Fabian, is the magic question? So the last one was $400 million. Let's go with $13 billion. Occasionally, you'll see like 12.7. Here's the deal. Remember 13. If it rounds to 13, it's the Marshall Plan, okay? So the Marshall Plan allocates $13 billion to rebuild uh, Europe. And Russia's like, no. Russia does not take advantage. And so this is just a, the quote about it. 
The U.S. shall provide aid to all European nations that need it. The move is not against any country or doctrine, a.k.a. it's not anti-communist, according to him, but hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. And so I think, again, this is trying to prevent Germany post-World War I kind of thing. And in all fairness, if it does that, it's a lot cheaper than going to war. Catch-22, what's the best choice? It depends. It's easy to say on the forefront it's this one or that one, but until it all shakes out, right? We just don't know. So the Marshall Plan starts in 47, but it ends in 48. So we're going to use the year 1948 with that. 47 was the what doctrine? And it's about uh, what two places? Greece and Turkey. Marshall Plan is about the money to rebuild for what places europe europe Europe. very good all right uh truman doctrine was how much 400 mil um marshall plan is round up to 13. all right so this is something that students misconstrue and misunderstand all the time now i want you just to stop and look at me with your beady little eyes and you're not in beady little eyes. And I want you to get this. This is not the Berlin Wall. The Berlin blockade is not the Berlin Wall. Well, the wall comes down in the 80s. Here's the deal. I think in some ways, I think that, oh, that you are... You don't have the same background coming into the Cold War for most of you that world history students normally have because of Corona. And so some of this, if I talk about it very basically, it is not because I don't think you're intelligent. It's because I don't, I think I'm talking to you about stuff you haven't really covered to be fair. Does that make sense? And so I would rather you understand it on a very basic level and to keep it with you. And honestly, this is something that I still see. The wall isn't built into the sixties. We're in the forties. And so in the late 1940s, to be specific, 48, Stalin is going to put up a blockade. Now, what's the difference in a blockade and a wall? This is a blockade. Think about how they set up for parades. This is more permanent. This is a wall. I could say, no, don't come in here. You got to come in through Tasso's room. Okay, well, that's that's a block. You could come over that, but then you know, then you're gonna be in trouble or whatever. There's gonna be consequences, but still it can happen. This is a wall. These are two very different things, right? This is 1948. This is 1962. All right. So let's talk about this. Explain to you my favorite way to explain the Berlin blockade in Ireland. So 1948. The nine communist nations that have positions in Germany decide to form an alliance. We shall call it West Germany, West Berlin. How do we remember this? We West. We West. So here is the way I like to explain it. Picture it. Fourth grade. Stalin hears that his friends he's sitting on the bus with are having a slumber party. Oh, he's so excited. He likes pizza. He likes scary movies. He likes to tell ghost stories with flashlight under a sleeping bag. And he knows somebody else says, hey, you know your friends, they're having this party, right? He's like, oh, awesome. We all sit on the bus together. I'm sure I'm going to be invited. Monday bus ride rolls around. 
Nobody says anything. Tuesday bus ride rolls around. Stalin got out his My Little Pony sleeping bag. He was all pumped. Nobody says anything. Wednesday bus ride rolls around. A brony. My nephew's a brony. I have a lot of nephews, but one of my nephews is a brony. Wednesday bus ride rolls around. He's like, hey, guys, what kind of pizza are we ordering? And they're like, you can't eat pizza with us. And this, and we can only have three people. Oh, our bad. Maybe next party you get to get your sleeping bag and come with us. So basically, these three other nations are like, hey, we're all this alliance now. And which works out if you don't have a little chunk inside the guy who's not in your group's thing. And so this is like they come to him and they're like, hey, Stalin, we know we didn't invite you, but can we borrow your scary movies? <laughs> no. And so Stalin gets his feelings hurt because he doesn't get invited. And so what does he do? What any logical third grader would do? Blockade, 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 blockade. Starve a bunch of people to death. He blocks the waterways, the railroads, and the roads. Now I want you to think about how brilliant this is. And on his part, it's one of those things if it works, you got the best of them. He puts them in a hard spot because. Those little people in West Germany, they need that stuff, right? We are having a historical experience in Miss Green's room. Hello, Mr. Okay. Okay. All right. Say, hey, Mr. Covington, to see you for one second. So at two seconds, you walk out of there. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. You got one. All right, so check this out. Blockade, blockade, blockade. Now, as Hunter correctly deduced, there are a bunch of people in there that are our allies, and they don't have any supplies. Water, food. You know, you think about, we forget. Well, go back to even like during COVID. When it first started and people decided to like take every single thing out of every grocery store, 7,000 rolls of toilet paper I shall have, you know, that kind of thing, right? Meat. Uh, meat. Like I know we went down. Uh, my child has a small mac and cheese addiction. It was like, I remember like seeing this lady pushing a mac and cheese cart. Um, and managed to like reach over and grab like two packs of mac and cheese to take home. You know, I was ready to wrestle those days on it. You started to see shortage on food, right? Why? Because the supply trucks weren't coming in. And so we think we have this unlimited supply. But we are a lot more vulnerable than we think. And so what you see here. I love the, the cartoon at the bottom that shows the bear with his arms around Berlin and not letting people in or out. So here are our choices. Well, we can take our tanks and take the water to them. What is that when you roll your tanks into a nation's country? That would be an act of war. We would be starting it. And so what Stalin's basically wanting to, to happen is for West Berlin to surrender and join East Berlin. And basically, we lost them. But the Americans and the British, because, you know, the French don't really help a lot, um, a.k.a. World War II. Uh, but anyway, I went really badly for you French people. I'm very sorry for all of your losses. But uh, what you see here is the U.S. and Great Britain get together, and they try a Hail Mary. They decide to start flying airplanes because airspace, they can fly. And making drops because it was almost it was too small for them to land massive planes in there and so with my idea about the Berlin airlift it's like when you hear they're making drops you're thinking they're dropping like you know one load a day they are dropping dozens of loads of supplies daily and it is, at first, Stalin thinks it's funny because some of the planes actually miss and things get damaged. But then they figure it out. 
And the airlift is going to go on from June 24th, 1948, until May 12th, 1949. June 24th, 19, uh, 1948 to May 12th, 1949. 11 months. 11 months. Give me a DoorDash. I mean, you know, that's pretty massive. That is pretty massive. 11 months. British American transportation of all supplies uh, to Berlin. Basically, all the roads were blocked, all the canals were blocked, and all the railways, but it works. And what I kind of think is funny here that Stalin does is they literally wake up on May 12th and the blockades are gone. Because at some point, it's kind of pointless, isn't it? It's not working. And so he's left with choices. What do you do? You keep doing something that just doesn't work. And so he decides, no, nah, I'll try again later. You know, This is not effective. And Stalin is one who, instead of, you know, I just, I love that they wake up and they're like, okay, well, I guess we, I guess we don't have to do that. Uh, for sure. All right. So let's talk about NATO. NATO. Once again, blockade, wall. Not same thing. Blockade comes before wall. B before W, right? It's in the 40s. The wall's in the 60s, and the wall comes down in the 80s. It's like every 20 years. Not exactly, but close enough for our purposes. I try to stress that because when you see, here's what I find students do is they'll see a question that will say Berlin blockade, and their mind immediately goes to the wall, even though they know it's different. And one of the answer stems will be based on the wall and not the blockade. And if you're reading it that way, you can think correctly. So anytime it is blockade or wall, if it is Berlin, check the date. If it's 40s or 60s, because that makes a huge difference. All right. So let's talk about NATO. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So in 1949... The countries, they call themselves the countries of free Western Europe, are going to form an alliance. Now, if it is North Atlantic, that means they're around the North Atlantic Ocean here. You see this? All of those places in navy blue. Pretty much to make it simple, simple these are the non-communist nations. The non-communist nations form an alliance. Isn't that what we were trying to avoid? Yes. And so it is, I mean, these are kind of, other than, you know, missing like Russia and China, these are pretty much premier nations of the world. You see some others join a little later, but basically NATO is, um, is formed as a non-communist alliance. Now, uh, it's NATO has come under question in the last few years as to whether or not it should still even be a thing. Because realistically, you know, we, we aren't in that same fact. And I think Trump tried to, he pulled away from some things that NATO was, were, was doing, I should say. Now, the communists are going to answer NATO with Warsaw. And the Warsaw Pact, of course, by the way, Russia is one big honking country, isn't it? Like, that's massive. That is a big country. And so the Warsaw Pact is the USSR and her satellite nations. So Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. And so those are the areas. And notice how they're all pretty much together. Uh, and so there again, there's that Iron Curtain, right? Everything on one side communist and everything on the other is not well not everything but you get the idea all right um, what's the major N uh, north atlantic treaty organization i basically remember it as non-communist north atlantic treaty organization yeah, sorry, that's okay but you're only gone for a second yeah, I'm online, it's all good all right. And so I do want to point this out because oftentimes when people refer to the Cold War, we see the Soviet Union as the aggressor, right? 
Who had the first alliance? We did. We did. Oh, I mean, you know, this was more, this was the U.S. This was, we were obviously a big factor in that. Now, something huge is going to happen in 1949. In 1949, China becomes communist. Now, this really isn't that strongly because of influence from Russia. This has to do with basically a civil war within China herself. But for these non-communist nations, particularly the United States, who wants to do what with communist? communism? Contain. To have a nation that has the largest population in the world quote unquote fall to communism or convert to communism or transition to communism doesn't feel like containment. Now it's interesting because Chinese communist or the the communism of China and the communism of Russia are two completely different things. And a lot of times they're not friend they're frenemies at best, for sure. Very different ideas. However, at this time in U.S. history, we grouped them together because it's if you're not on my side, you're the enemy. And so China, I read this really good. I think it was in the it was actually in the Spud Turkle book where he interviewed different people. And he talked about there was a guy in there who talked about how confused he was because when they would fight in Japan, they were told about how noble the Chinese people were. And then he says, just a few years later, we were told how horrible they were because now they were communists. And so this just shows you how this this kind of this kind of systematic thing works. But China does fall to communism, and um, the U.S. and Soviets both kind of help their respective sides. But once again, Russia is not really strongly involved, nor are we. However, we really don't get involved as far as fighting. And I think it's very important to mention this happened in 49 because I think it is going to affect how we choose to handle things in 1950. How we choose to handle things in 1950. Uh, we have to give a little blurb about Israel. Yes. So the UN is going to create the Jewish state of Israel. Now, it is both new and it is both ancient at the same time, but it is a new country at this time period. And so this was actually created by the first African-American to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Probably most of you thought that was Dr. King, right? He's second. No. Does anybody know who was first? His name is Dr. Ralph Bunch. Ralph? So, Dr. Ralph Bunch has this idea that what we should do is we should take this area of Palestine that used to belong to uh, the Jewish people and split it and to make two nations, to make Palestine and Israel. And so, the initial halfway split was denied by the Palestinians because there is a very crucial city to both major religions here. Now, not everybody of Jewish descent practiced Judaism. Just like not everybody of Palestinian descent is necessarily like hardcore Islam here. It is an Islamic state, and Israel is a Jewish state, which means that you have to honor the codes of those religions there, but it doesn't mean you have to practice. Does that make sense? Like if you were to travel into Palestine and you were female, you would be expected to cover your head. It's just part of their custom. You can say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, you wouldn't be allowed in their country. It's the rule. Certain places you have to cover your face. Certain places, like like if you go into certain different areas, like Morocco, you're not supposed to. Morocco is a totally different place, but you're not allowed to like show arms and things. You're expected to wear shirts that come below your elbows. It's one of those things. If you don't agree with it, you just don't go because that's the rule. Yeah. Now, anyway, I say this to say this. So uh, the problem is that both religions view Jerusalem as a crucial city to their religious beliefs. 
I I have never been to Israel. My cousin has been several times, um, but I've never been. I've heard it is both a beautiful city. It's a very dangerous city, too, because a lot of your extremist groups, because the city is divided in half, like because as Americans, we Israel is usually an ally of ours. Um, if you were there as an American, you would need to stay on the Israeli side. Yeah. yeah I, and but the same thing would be said if you were, you know, it's, it's a lot of tension on both sides. So to be fair to both. But at any rate, they decide to split Jerusalem like we're into all this splitting stuff. Right. So here's the Palestinian half. Here's the Israeli half. But Jerusalem is inside Israel and it is going to be split between the two. And so Palestine gives up a little bit to get Jerusalem. And uh, it is it's a major, major city and three major three of the four major three of the four major world religions. So Jerusalem is a crucial city. All right. We know that this is very important. What happened here in 1948? If religion is important to you or not, it really is insignificant to this. But that is still a major hotbed and has been ever since 1948. There is constant controversy and different ideas about what should happen with Israel. All right. So where we will pick up tomorrow is we're going to go to war in Korea. Tomorrow. Well, this is what is called, it's not called a war, it's called a conflict. Conflict. Conflict means that when we're not sure if we won in the end, we can blame it on somebody else. We can call it a proxy war.